Welcome to yet another Aspire demonstration movie. In this one we'll focus on the software protection metrics that have been developed at Ghent University. We'll look at both the theoretical framework that we propose to measure the strength of software protections against MATE attacks, and we'll look at some tool support that we developed to automate the collection and computation of those metrics. Now in order to understand how we want to measure the impact of deploying software protections on attacks, it's important to understand how we model these attacks. There's another movie that discusses this in more detail, uh, but here I'll give a brief introduction. So as you might know, we propose to model attacks with Petri nets. Here you have one. At the start of an attack, an attacker has no knowledge. He has not reached any of his goals or sub-goals. At the very end of the Petri net, he has reached his final goal. And there are multiple paths to reach those goals. And he can try to achieve one sub-goal after the other along any of these attack paths. And so these nodes in the middle model sub-goals. The black squares, they are transitions in the terminology of Petri nets. And in our case, they model attack steps. For example, this part here models that if an attacker has reached this goal, for example, he has collected a trace or he has identified the code under attack, and he executes this attack step, then he has reached some final goal. Now we can build these Petri net models of attacks both on protected and on the original applications. And then we can try to estimate the effort for all attack pods and aggregate them somehow for a full attack. And then we can compare the effort that an attacker needs on the different versions of an application. And in order to allow that, and what we'll focus on in this presentation, is that per attack step, we will estimate the effort that an attacker has to invest in it. And we will estimate that by computing a weighted sum of complexity metrics. Now it's written here and I just said a weighted sum, but in practice other formulas might be used. The important thing is that there are multiple complexity metrics and for each attack step, which has a specific goal and which is performed at a specific point in time during an attack, we will combine metrics in a specific way. Of course, if an attack step involves looking and studying a trace, we will only look at metrics that are relevant for traces not metrics that you can compute on control flow graphs. Or if an attacker is using either Pro to understand code, to reverse engineer code, and he's looking at the control flow graphs, then of course we will only look at metrics that are relevant for those graphs. So for each attack step, we propose to use a specific combination of a specific formula to combine different metrics, and only the metrics relevant for that attack step. So which complexity metrics uh, should we use? Well, in our project, we've defined 12 categories of complexity metrics. And basically, these are features that we want to measure. And for all of them, we also propose some concrete metrics. For example, Halstead's metric allows you to compute the size of a program, not just the number of instructions, but it's a combination of the number of instructions, the number of operands, and so on. And there are many other concrete metrics that we proposed, some of them from literature, some of them that we propose ourselves. Uh, we cannot discuss them all here, but you can look them up in Deliverable 4.06. That's a public report. Just as an example, uh, one of the metrics we propose is cyclomatic complexity. The formula to compute cyclomatic complexity was proposed about 40 years ago by McCabe, and it relates to the testability of a code fragment. The cyclomatic complexity grows if you need to provide more inputs to cover the interesting parts in a graph when you want to test them. Now, if you want to compute this metric for some node in your Petri net, of course, it's important to reason about what code fragments you should compute it on. In each attack step, an attacker will be focusing on one or more code fragments and on the representation that he has built from those code fragments. And that is not necessarily the same as the original representation that he got, for example, uh, from either Pro. So the question is, how do you compute these metrics on those fragments? Well, to identify the relevant fragments, we're just going to rely on the source code annotations that identify the code that corresponds to the assets in the program. For deciding on the representation to use, however, to compute, for example, the cyclomatic number, we have to look elsewhere. As an example here, consider, for example, that an original control flow graph might look like this on the left here. And then when you obfuscate this code with a complex obfuscation technique, it might look like in the middle. But maybe after an attacker has studied your traces 
and has removed opaque predicates and other protections, he can simplify this control flow graph to something that looks like this. And the question is, for each attack step, which of these forms should we use, for example, to compute cyclomatic complexity? Well, in our propose, we will not be using a single of these representations. We will use all of them. Because if an attacker has not deobfuscated the code yet, he will see this middle representation. After he has performed a deobfuscation, he might be seeing this form. So for every place in a Petri net, when an attacker has reached a sub-goal, he will have a different view on the program. And to compute the metrics, we will just try to estimate that view. For example, if we draw this Petri net around these representations, you see that at some point, the state here in the middle, an attacker has not deobfuscated the code yet, then he can perform a deobfuscation attack for example, he can deploy the method by Adigari et al. that was presented at Security and Privacy uh, 2015. And then he will get a deobfuscated uh, control flow graph. To compute the complexity of performing this attack, we're going to compute metrics on this representation. But then to compute the complexity for the next attack step, when an attacker has already simplified his understanding and the view he has from the program, we will use this form to compute the metrics. To compute this, we propose what we call resilience metrics. These metrics basically measure how easy it is for an attacker to simplify the representation of the program. Some of the features that we look at are static variability that will basically measure whether if some protection code is inserted, it always looks the same or not. We will also look at inter-execution variability. If some instruction always computes the same result, this instruction can be simplified. Uh, we can also look at semantic relevance. Any code that in some trace does not contribute to the computation of the outputs of the program is irrelevant, so it can be removed from the trace and then also from the control flow graphs. Uh, and we'll look at styled, for example, because if it's easy to spot that some piece of code computes an opaque predicate, the attacker can easily remove it. And so we will compute these metrics for all code fragments and then suppose that on this fragment we need to compute the cyclomatic complexity. But suppose it is in a step where an attacker has already obtained enough information to throw out all the code that is not relevant, that has no variability, and so on. Then we will give some of the nodes in these graphs smaller weights, like the ones uh, drawn lighter here now, and we will adapt the computation of the metrics such that those nodes do not contribute at all or contribute less to the computed complexity. Now, there are other cases we have to consider. And more specifically, we have to wonder how we're going to measure complexity when some piece of code is not available to an attacker. For example, suppose we removed some code from the program uh, and instead it will be executed on a server. Then the program looks like this. And so obviously the complexity metric will be lower. But of course, this would give a false impression. It's not because the complexity here of the fragment that an attacker will study is smaller that the attack has become easier. In fact, it's quite the opposite. Now, to account for that, we propose another set of metrics, and we call these unavailability metrics. And those take into account whether code is unavailable statically. Eh? It may be downloaded, so it's available dynamically, but not statically. Or maybe it's not available at all because it's going to be executed on a server. Or maybe it will only be available for a limited time, for example, uh, because code is downloaded from the server, but then immediately after it's been executed, it's flushed from the program's address space. With the complexity, resilience, stealth, and unavailability metrics, we think we can try to measure and estimate the impact of all our protections on all possible uh, relevant attack steps. But as I said before, that's just the theoretic framework. Now let's have a look at the tool support that we developed uh, for the metrics. We'll do that in our VM. First, let's have a look at the configuration of our tool chain. Uh, this tool chain automatically computes the static metrics. That's done during the link time rewriting. But it also has a section where you can specify how to compute the dynamic metrics. And basically what you need to do is to tell the tool chain how to run the binary that will be instrumented to collect the metrics. So you specify a script. If you look at the script, you see it here. It's very simple. It contains a section where you have to specify how to copy 
the input data uh, and the binaries or the libraries to your developer board. It also contains a function that will run a command to execute the binary. In this case you see here that we will execute it multiple times. So we will actually uh, collect multiple traces. And then there's also a function to copy back the data from the board onto your host where you're compiling the program. Now we compile the program with our toolchain and deploy the protections. I'm going to speed this up because it takes a while. While the toolchain is performing the last processing steps, I can scroll back in the log and point you to some of the steps that are executed. Uh, one of them here is that the script is executed to collect the metrics. Later in the log, you see also that some post uh, processing is done. That's basically to combine the collected information from the traces and to combine them into metrics. Now let's have a look at some metrics. First we'll have a look in the bco2 din directory. That's where the unprotected library version is stored. And you see if we look into the file, you see that region numbers are given at the start of each line and then in different columns the different, uh, the different static complexity metrics for each region are presented. You see some of the ones that I mentioned earlier on in the presentation. We can also look at the metrics that were computed with the self-profiling or self-tracing version of our binary that we generated. And you see here that the dynamic metrics are computed again for each region. So these are the metrics uh, computed on the vanilla, the unprotected library. But we can also have a look in the directory bco5 where the protected library is stored. Uh, also of that version a self-profiling binary was generated and it was also executed on the board. We can look at the static metrics, so we also have this for the protected binary. You see the same metrics are computed. And if you would rewind the video, you see that the numbers have increased, and that's because we have made the code more complex by means of binary obfuscations. Also the dynamic metrics, we can compute them. Uh, it's straightforward actually. The Aspire project received funding from the European Union 7th Framework Program under grant number 609734.